Hello, you're watching Global Mirror. I'm Shreya Upadhyay. It's largely been a Donald Trump week with the president-elect nominating his cabinet from Tulsi Gabbard to Robert Kennedy Jr. The world's eyes were on who is heading which department. We'll get you more on this and the historic win of Sri Lankan President Dissanayake's party in the parliamentary elections and what it means for him. Lots lined up today, but let's first begin with Trump 2.0. Team Trump 2.0 is being unveiled one by one and the world is watching closely. In the past few days, a flurry of appointments have been made for the Trump administration, taking in some of his staunch loyalists into his cabinet. Take a look at the names who've made it to the list so far. A tradition that was not fulfilled in 2020 when Donald Trump had lost. Unlike Trump, Joe Biden invited President-elect Donald Trump to the White House in a reflection of smooth transfer of power. Trump's historic victory paved way for a slew of appointments, which would have an impact not just on America, but the entire world. 78-year-old Trump is the older US president but his cabinet is much younger than the Biden cabinet. The 47th president-elect of the United States has long been labeled as an anti-woman leader. Yet, the glass ceiling has been broken under his administration. After Susie Wiles as the first female White House chief of staff, Donald Trump nominated Tulsi Gabbard as the director of national intelligence, the second female in American history to occupy the position. The Trump cabinet has nominated the first Hindu congresswoman to lead 18 spy agencies of the United States and be Trump's intelligence advisor. Tulsi Gabbard, Trump said, would bring her fearless spirit into the intelligence community. In the past, Tulsi has spoken on the Kashmir issue, saying it's important as outsiders to understand the complex history of Kashmir that families were forced to flee and could never return in a reference to Kashmiri pundits. She has also condemned the continued attacks on Hindu minorities in Bangladesh since 2021. Trump has also picked Thomas Homan as his border czar, Marco Rubio as Secretary of State, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as Health Secretary, Mike Walls as his National Security Advisor, Stephen Miller as the Deputy Chief of Staff, Christy Noem as Department of Homeland Security Secretary, Matt Gates as the Attorney General, and Elise Stefanik as the UN Ambassador. Immigration hardliners Stephen Miller and Tom Homan have the immigrants worried. In Trump 1.0, Miller crafted the immigration policy that saw families breaking up at the border. South Dakota Governor Christy Noem, nominated as Homeland Security Chief, has also pledged to carry out mass deportations. But observers say it is only the illegals who should be worried. Marco Rubio and Mike Walls, along with Indian origin Vivek Ramaswamy and Elon Musk in Department of Government Efficiency, which would work outside the cabinet, are known for their pro-India stance. However, even with a seemingly pro-India team Trump, all eyes are now on what MAGA leaders do in the next four years. With their focus sharply on making America great again, creating job opportunities for American citizens, reducing inflation and increasing trade tariffs, the India-US relationship rests on the contours of each department and their decisions. Now call it the Department of Government Efficiency or Crypto Resembling Dodge. The world's richest man Elon Musk and Indian origin Vivek Ramaswamy have been chosen as the men who would lead it in Trump 2.0. Here's a report on its tasks and the controversy surrounding it. Donald John Trump. It's official. Donald Trump has a Department of Government Efficiency and he has picked the world's richest man, Elon Musk, and Indian origin Vivek Ramaswamy as the men leading it. It's a department that will work outside of the Trump cabinet and carry out its task. Dodge has its task cut out. Dismantling government bureaucracy, 
slashing excess regulations, cutting wasteful expenditures and restructuring federal agencies. The top agenda for Dodge. And they have time till the 4th of July 2026 to complete them. The assertion while setting up the Department of Government Efficiency is that they will liberate the economy. But as soon as the appointments were made, concerns of conflict of interest arose. For starters, the name Dodge resembles Dogecoin, a cryptocurrency supported and pushed by Musk. Billionaire Elon Musk owns space exploration company SpaceX, electric vehicle pioneer Tesla, Neuralink that helps people with paralysis communicate using brain activity, a construction company called The Boring Company, artificial intelligence mission Psy, and social media platform X. This week, Elon Musk reportedly met with the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations a day before he was named as one of the heads of Dodge. The meeting was on how to defuse tensions between Iran and the United States. Earlier, during a Trump-Zelensky phone call, Musk reportedly happened to be present there. Even though the presence and influence of private lobbies isn't new to the United States, it clearly blurs the lines between public service and corporate profit. Would his actions in Dodge be driven by his own vested interests? Will the crypto market be impacted? Can market manipulation be ruled out? The answers to these questions are only a wait and watch game. Bureau Report, Mirror Now. Moving on, a day after UK newspaper The Guardian quit social media platform X for allegedly becoming increasingly toxic and manipulating content, Spain's fourth largest newspaper, La Vanguardia, said that it will stop posting on Elon Musk's X platform and plans to suspend its accounts. The newspaper cited that it had become an echo chamber for disinformation and conspiracy theories, along with hate speech not being curtailed. While Musk has said that he defends freedom of speech on X, the Barcelona-based newspaper stated that it lacked an effective and reasonable moderating process since the billionaire bought it in 2022. Now, the announcements were condemned by several ex-users for what they said were liberal-inclined newspapers. Let's try and get a wider perspective on this. Professor Madhav Nalapa, geopolitical expert, is joining us on the Global Mirror uh, this evening. Professor Nalapa, good evening. Namaskar. You know, what do you make of this, Professor Nalapath? Lots of mixed reactions that are coming in. Some, uh, you know, X has completely bifurcated people in terms of, you know, how they see views being presented on the platform. Uh, but your take on how several media agencies, newspapers, magazines have announced that they will be quitting X? Frankly, Shreya, when you're talking of freedom of speech, and then you're saying you're quitting a platform because you don't like its content or the bulk of its content. I'm not sure that that comes a definition of freedom of speech. Now, you know, you have, you have what is it, Twitter uh, under Dorsey. Twitter definitely promoted a very um, a line which was certainly not uh, friendly to the right at all, to the conservatives, but very friendly to the left. And, um, and as a consequence, what happened was many conservatives were very popular. They found that uh, their, their tweets were being muffled. Uh, they, they, suddenly their followers were disappearing. And uh, this happened. So Twitter, frankly, was really no exemplar of free speech. As far as X is concerned, I'm not sure that Elon Musk is going to worry very much about it. Look at the way you know, attacks have been made. For example, Ukraine. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, many people have been oppo opposed to the Ukraine war, but they couldn't say so. Now, Tulsi yes. Gabbard said that Ukraine is a disaster in 2022. In 2024, tell me what it is if it's not a disaster. She said Syria would be a disaster. Tell me what happened. Bashar Assad now, and that is in back in 2011, by the way. I think the era of the Obamas uh, uh, yeah. and Hillary Clinton. What happened? So Bashar Assad continued, and Syria completely fragmented. 
and huge amounts of money were poured into so-called uh, resistance fighters, many of whom turned out to be terrorists. I mean, look at you know, look at Libya, look at so many other examples, look at Afghanistan. Trump now claims that okay, he would not have left Bagram. I don't know if that's true or not, but it is true that Biden just left Pell Mell. And the fact is, in every one of this, whether it is a question of you know Ukraine, that Ukraine war is a disaster for Ukraine mainly, and it will never create a problem. Yeah. Professor Nalapat, can I also ask you then? Yeah. You know, the US presidential election saw the significance and the emergence of alternative media platforms like X and podcasts and YouTube uh, as platforms which can play a significant role in elections, in campaigning, in candidates trying to reach out to their voters, as opposed to the traditional media of newspapers and television news channels, which seemingly and increasingly, uh, you know, are perceived to be biased by the citizens. How do you see that really, you know, going about moving forward, uh, considering that, you know, a lot of these uh, media agencies and activists and groups term platforms like X as right-wing or as biased as platforms with hate speech without any censorship? Look, uh, Shreya, the fact is that the digital age is here to stay, and more and more uh, people are going to turn to the digital age and use digital platforms. That's a fact of life. And these platforms are going to become much more efficient yes. and uh, very useful. So that's going to happen. And one can argue that paper, you know, cuts down forests. That's not a very good thing to, to happen, cutting down forests. But the reality is the digital age has now come, and the digital age is not only here to stay, it's there to expand. There's no question about that. But having said that, I'd like to point out that, you know, when you talk about free speech, and then you say anyone who disagrees with you, anyone who disagreed with the intervention in Syria, Anyone who, who disagreed with the intervention uh, uh, in, hmm. in, in countries, uh, you know, uh, like you, Ukraine, it's since 2014, frankly, and especially since 2022, you're unpatriotic, you're, uh, you're, hate, you're indulging in hate speech, you're indulging, the people who say that are indulging in hatred against such people. I mean, they themselves are showing intolerance and hatred. And if I may say so, The Guardian, I mean, you know, you know uh, I don't know about this Barcelona newspaper, but The Guardian is an example of, of a newspaper that presents one particular point of view and basically hardly ever the other point of view, except as a parody or very occasionally. And they put it almost as a figure or to be laughed at. So frankly, Shreya, the freedom of speech means Genuine freedom of speech. You say something I don't like, I say something you don't like, and you listen to it. You know, I mean, uh, the, that's the way, for example, uh, uh, a television platform ought to be. But if you're, a, let's say, for example, you're a platform like some of the big platforms in the US, and they're going out on a, a demonizing Musk, demonizing his Trump picks. Look, the incoming defense secretary, he is negative on China. He feels the army has not woken up to the danger from mm. China. I think a lot of people feel the same. But for that, okay. he said, Tulsi Kabat said, oh, Bashar Assad, you can't defeat him. You couldn't defeat him. Tulsi Kabat said the Ukraine war of in 2019, you know, I mean, in, in 2022. Sure, was so there is a lot of... And it's true. There is a lot of labeling and a... And the cancel culture, Professor Nalapad, that comes in exactly. in the online world from both sides, whether it's the liberals or, uh, you know, the right wing um, or, uh, or even, the, you know, the independents, the neutral guys, even they end up uh, being labeled or labeling somebody else. Uh, but how do you see uh, it in India, considering the fact that, you know, online medium, online platforms have gained significance here as well? But there's also that challenge of misinformation, disinformation, fake news uh, being part of this information narrative. Look, if uh, it depends, you know, if, if news is not based on fact, there's no doubt it is incorrect, uh, whether it's because of, with a malign motive or not, 
he can't say. There's no doubt about it. But the fact is, in the case of the United States, for example, Shreya, the people of the United States shifted in a way that, frankly, the Biden camp could not understand. The people of India shifted uh, majorly in 2014, and they basically, despite a huge effort uh, in this 2024 election to uh, make sure he doesn't come back for a third term, uh, Prime Minister Modi came back for a third term. These are decisions by a sovereign people. Mm, okay. So if you say that Trump, you know, was responsible for what's happening in America, no. The change in America was adjusted to by Trump in a way it was not adjusted to by Biden. And ultimately, it's a voter who decides. Mm. And the voters decide, and that's, and that's fine. That's democracy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We leave it there, uh, Professor Madhav Nalapath. Of course, uh, you know, uh, Musk has also said that these companies have been trying to blackmail him with money. But let's see how this moves forward for now. Many of them leaving and announcing that they're quitting the ex-social media platform. Thank you very much, Professor Madhav Nalapath, for joining us on Global Mirror and sharing your perspective. Moving on and shifting our focus to Sri Lanka now, viewers, where Sri Lankan President Anura Dissanayake now has the mandate that he needs to tackle corruption in his country and recover stolen assets after the financial crash. Dissanayake's leftist coalition achieved a landslide victory in snap parliamentary elections, a powerful mandate to fight poverty and corruption in the crisis-stricken nation, something that the new president has promised the Lankans. Anura Dissanayake's National People's Power, or NPP coalition, secured a two-thirds majority in the parliament, winning 159 out of the 225 seats, which is a huge lead on opposition alliance Samagi Janabalvegaya, or SJB, which won 40 seats. Moving on, the 19th G20 summit will be held in Rio de Janeiro on the 18th and 19th of November. And all eyes are now on how global leaders will address pressing economic and social challenges. This year's summit theme is building a just world and a sustainable planet. It strongly aligns with the priorities that India advanced in 2023. Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be attending the summit and will put forth concerns of the global south and its important position amid the two wars. The Brazil summit also marks the first time the African Union will participate as a full member of the G20, an inclusion that underscores the growing importance of multilateral collaboration between emerging economies and advanced nations. With that, it's a wrap on Global Mirror. News and updates will continue on Mirror now. Thank you very much for joining us at the moment. Bye-bye.